My name is Alan Bogosian. I'm the chair of the Concord Historical Commission and welcome to the joint meeting between the Concord Historical Commission and the Concord Historical District Commission um, on February 23rd, 2024. Uh, this meeting will be uh, recording um, and in conjunction with the open meeting policies. Um, at, at this point, I'll hand it over to Anne to introduce the uh, agenda and move forward. Okay, so um, I wrote a little introduction. <laughs> it's, it's very exciting. Um, so welcome to the first, to the uh, kickoff joint meeting for the Concord Historic Preservation Planning Project. Thank you as, al as always for taking the time out of your busy lives to share your expertise and contribute to the community. We're most grateful for all of the work you do to preserve and shape Concord's extraordinary power of place. We've been working toward this project for the past year and a half, raising funds, hiring preservation consultants, and are very excited to finally be getting it off the ground. Heritage Strategies will be leading us through this process, which must be new to all of us since Concord's last townwide historic preservation planning document was written in 2001, over two decades ago. The world has changed quite a lot since then, and so has the field of preservation. So we're lucky to have with us a consultant with expertise in developing plans for communities, national heritage areas, and world heritage sites here in Massachusetts and across the country. <clears throat> we hope that the motto for the Concord 250th, still heard around the world, has will inspire this effort. This is no exaggeration. This is a small community, this small community has helped shape the American identity. It has a platform and influence. Places of memory like Concord enhance the quality of life and have the power to open minds, provoke thought, and inspire action. And preservationists play a vital role today at this critical moment in history when the stakes perhaps have never been higher. We will probably be talking about nuts and bolts at the kickoff meeting this morning but I hope we keep the aspirational ideals that Concord represents in mind every step of the way so that the final product truly reflects the values and dreams of this legendary American town. It will take a village to make it happen. <laughs> and so we're so glad you're all here. And thank you, Melissa, especially. Um, she was the former chair who really um, got this project going. Um, so thank you, Melissa, for Making oh, that's very kind because, um, yes, I, I tried to get this preservation plan, um, a draft for a grant written for some time, more than a year and a half. And COVID got in the way and then the demolition delay bylaw amendment got in the way, which is a good thing. And the scenic rose bylaw, but with the arrival of Anne and her wonderful command of language and her understanding of what the grant really needed to be, and her um, relationship, I think she already had with Mass Historical, we were successful in getting it. Um, and that's a $50,000, as you know, it's getting two parts, one from the CPC and from Mass Historical. So actually, thank you, Anne. <laughs> so turn it back over to Alan. And should we, we can, uh, the meeting has been called to order, so we can start uh, with uh, Elizabeth. Do you want to? uh go through the uh introductions um and speak about that or sure <clears throat> um I, I, just to introduce peter and myself we're the principals of heritage strategies we are you are looking at heritage strategies with the exception of um our third partner who is peter's wife and um keeps us straight in terms of uh, managing all kinds of things that keep a company going um and we have been um preservation planners. Uh, Peter is an architect, historical architect, um, for more than 40 years each. And um, we went into business um, almost exactly 15 years ago. And we did this in order to make sure that we ourselves, in, in, in big consulting firms, seniors like ourselves don't get their hands on actual projects. They actually have to just delegate. Um, and so we we wanted a different kind of approach. And so you have the two of us paying close attention to a community that really needs close attention. Um, I would like very much to have introductions go around. Um, Alan, do you want to manage that for us? We we do need to um, I, I need to understand who's 
which I think I know, but it would be helpful. Yep, I'm sorry. Uh, what we'll do is we'll in introduce members from the Historical Commission. Um, I'm Alan Bogosian, and we can have the members introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with Melissa. Okay, M Melissa Sawfield, Historical Commission. Nancy. Nancy Nelson, uh, Historical Commission. Nancy Frisella. Nancy Frisella Lee, Historical Commission. And I, uh, Chessie. Hi everyone, Chessie Cataldo, Historical Commission. And I think that's it. And um, then the members of the Historic District Commission. Um, I see Tim first. Hi everybody, Tim Whitney with Historic Districts. Louis. I'm Louis Peristeria, a Historic Districts Commission, as I understand. <laughs> <laughs> you understand. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> the chair, Dennis. Back, back again. Dennis Fiore, HDC. Uh, Kathleen. Kate Chartner, HDC. And I think uh, Melinda. Melinda Shumway, HDC. And I think that uh, I think that's it, right? And I... there's a phone number on here that yeah. I don't think we've heard from. Yeah, that's, that's Linda, uh, Escobedo. Linda Escobedo. I'm sorry. Former select person. Ah, okay. And incredible, the current, incredible current, select board, current select board person. Current oh, select sorry. Board. I know that. I know that. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> Kathleen? Hello? Yeah? That's yeah. not me on the phone. Unless, it, unless it's a different okay. Kathleen. Okay. No, 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 you were, but you were on video first. I was. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, there I am. Am I back? Yeah. Yeah, yes, there you sir. are. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. True. Yep. Um, Alan, are you? Shall we go to the next item? Yeah. Let's. Do you want to? You want to do this? The scope of the of what. Because of the meeting we had earlier this week, you know, we talked a little bit about the schedules and and what what our scope was, and a lot of folks weren't here at that point. Um, you know, between the surveys and plans, um, if we could just recap that the schedule for the sure. other members that are here. Well, I thought what we do is if you think of the if you look at our agenda, we have six items. The first yeah. three. Um, our number three is really the focus for today's meeting. Um, and I just wanted to show you quickly there, there, there we're going to have um, more language uh, out of our scope. But here I want to, uh, can I just share my screen? Is that, is that uh, possible there? Sure. Good. Okay. Here we go. Um, if you go on, there is a special web page for uh, under the CHC um, or the town of Concord. Um, and let's see here. Um, in that web page, you can find the entire scope, which is our proposal. Um, and it's, it basically forms the basis of our contract. Um, I just wanted you to be familiar with this. Uh, what we have in the way of a project is a four phase project um, following an outline that the Massachusetts Historical Commission requests. The first phase we've been in for some time now. And we are um, pulling together all of these different things that you see here, model preservation plans, introduction to preservation planning. Um, this is task 1.4 is today. That's what we're doing right now. Um, getting a list of partners and stakeholders. Melissa has been helping us with that. Um, looking at the historical development of Concord, um, just you have a lot of that material. We just have to boil it down and, and, and provide some references for people to go get more details elsewhere. Looking at previous planning, um, what how, how that comprises a resource for us. Big resources for us, tasks uh, 1.8 and 1.9, are historic resources inventories. Um, these are your uh, four or five survey documents that were produced with the help of Ann McCarthy Forbes uh, at the end of the 1980s and into the 1990s. Um, and there is another uh, survey that was done closing out in 2013 of West Concord. So there's actually two West Concord 
surveys. Of, uh, the first one from under Ms. Forbes was also West Concord. Um, so you, you and essentially the, the the bottom line is is you guys have a great uh, number of inventories uh, and and uh, entries in the Massachusetts uh, Cultural Resource System, which you any of you can get. We can send you the link later if you're interested. But you can see Concord and you can see where all your historic resources are, where all the districts are. It's really really great material. The, the takeaway right now is to tell you that out of 351 towns and cities in Massachusetts, you are 20th in terms of how many resources you have documented. Mm -hmm. And we believe there's more that you're gonna need to get, but um, it's it's quite impressive um, for a small town. Um, and your your peers in roughly that same amount of, of uh, location is uh, Gloucester, Falmouth, and Plymouth. So mm -hmm. you're you're the inland town and there, you know, obviously Springfield and, and Boston are above you guys, but it was interesting to, to run that quick analysis. We also have to look at the National Register. You actually have a fairly small number of resources on the National Register. And um, that's another, those two are, are the, the sort of big writing that I've been focusing on with Peter um, more recently. Um, looking at your 2001 master plan, which by the way, was not done by a consultant, it was done by very talented people um, at the local level who really, looked hard at everything and Ms. McCarthy's surveys comprised a, a, a big piece of that. If you were to look at the 2001 survey, which is on your webpage for this for this current historic preservation planning, it will impress you with a large number of um, uh, sections on the survey and on the information and what it all is. It's, it's uh, more than 100 pages of that kind of material. It's uh, plan is a little more than 200 pages. But really at the heart of it are actions that we assess as being value for you now. And one of the things it called for was more National Register nominations. You have 27. Um, that's a smaller number in proportion to your to your uh, inventories. So, um, but there's a long list. It's about 71 recommendations. And one of the things that we're going to ask you guys to do is to look at those. Um, we'll we'll produce it for you so that you can work in it in a word form and get comments back to to Ann. Um, but uh, it's a good foundation for the recommendations we'll be developing later. We also have to look at your bylaws and regulations, and then we'll have uh, a review meeting with the Massachusetts Historical Commission. They expect a meeting at at regular points throughout this process. Um, so then there's there's a whole section on outreach, which is what is coming up and what we're going to spend more time on. So I'm skimming through this so you can just see that. And then uh, phase three is the recommendations. And again, I have a little bit more about that in the next document you're about to see. And then we'll be drafting the plan. Um, the schedule is um, really better roughed out through May than at any other point. We should be done by the end of the year. Um, and there are two public meetings, rounds of public meetings um, at the end of the development of recommendations. We wanna hold a meeting with the public before we finalize anything. Um, we, we can present findings, but we, we don't expect to present recommendations. We want the public to come in and talk to us. Um, and then at the very end, we, we would um, share a draft uh, plan. And of course, there's the whole process of adoption that, that you'll want to do with public um, outreach as well. I'm going to stop this share. And just remember, if you're curious to see more about this scope, it's it's available to you. Um, and here is what we're going to talk about today. and share. I don't usually do this. I usually let others run this part of it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So this this is uh, new material developed, um, fin finalized this morning. Um, and just wanted to walk you through public outreach and get your reaction and advice as we go through. Um, and I'll, I'll be uh, trying to take notes. I'm not um, uh, really going to be able to do it. Am I able to do it on screen? Yeah, I'm able to do it on screen. So um, so basically, there are four types of outreach planned. Um, the uh, there's a community-wide survey, much as you saw the DEI Commission do it, and you did it for Envision Concrete and several other 
um, fairly recent surveys. Um, and we're going to be asking questions about, um, you know, the awareness of, of your, the, your two bodies, um, getting insights into issues experienced by residents, businesses, and others, and present results. Um, and if, with that survey, we would expect to present the results at the at the public meeting. That that's a note there. Um, second is stakeholder interviews, one on one, two on two, small group, very small group. Uh, we see, uh, and the real detail is this: is uh, stakeholder focus groups. Um, where we invite um, people who have um, come to our attention in the community, we being you and um, town staff and um, helping us create an invitation list for this. And then finally, the public workshops that we just meet. We don't, call, we, I, I think I did call them public meetings, but we shouldn't. They're not um, public meetings in the, in the formal sense of the word where people walk up to the microphone and do that. We, we were looking, you know, we're looking for dialogue with the public. So it's called a workshop. So let's look at the community-wide survey first. Um, we, in each of these four um, pieces of public outreach, we're identifying what we would like to help get help from you guys. Um, we are, have just barely begun. We've shown Anne um, a list of questions that we've used in other communities, slightly adapted for Concord, and we really need to think through that and we're going to do all that under the hood stuff before we ask you guys to look at it so that there's we hope it'll be fairly clean and, and then because you're not allowed to i don't believe in massachusetts you're not allowed to meet by email um or if you do it would have to be public in some way deliberations by email in maryland where i live uh are, are forbidden um so how you do it is you each get a copy a word copy of the document you make your comments on it um, and then you send it back to Ann um, directly. You don't send it to the others. You send it just to Ann, and then Ann compiles those. And that way, we get your thoughts um, in a in a single document to be able to do some final work. Uh, time frame is this all takes place during March. We would like to see it issued perhaps by the end of the month for the survey, going through April. Um, we're mindful about the town meeting, maybe also tax day, April 15th town meeting at the end of the month, um, and how that might impinge on all of this planning. So speak up if you see um, anything that we think you think we should be um, concerned about. So um, we would like your help and your individual comments. And then marketing is going to be a big, big piece of this. DEI Commission got what I think I think they told us 700 responses. Um, from the community at large, that's a pretty big number and very nicely, very nice uh, response. And um, we would love to see that kind of response. One of the things about this entire phase that we're realizing is we've heard on several occasions from you guys, members of the CHC, members of the HDC, it's in your 2001 plan, is to use a, a casual phrase, you get no respect. It, that is, that you're not your role is not well understood in the community and appreciated in, in the way that um, would be helpful for your work. And so how do we deal with that? And our solution in the beginning here is to have a great conversation with your community about this plan in all these different ways to try to get people's um, understanding of the importance of historic preservation, that lovely statement that Anne had for us this morning, that kind of thinking needs to be imbued into everyone who lives in Concord as much as possible. And so there are different ways to think about that. But basically, the first time is, is to have a great conversation and get a good plan out of that. So that's that's the community-wide survey. Um, are there any? Um, Nancy? Uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I was just putting up my hand to ask if we should hold our questions. Um, I have more comment well, and maybe a caution about the surveys. I've noted many committees uh, develop their own surveys, and and I'm I'm concerned about how how much weight we put in those if they're not professionally guided and developed because bias can be built in if you're not only the asker of the questions, but have maybe a perspective on the answers to the questions. So it's um, it's more uh, how much do we rely in the end on a survey? That's all. Sure, we're not attempting statistical um, 
you know, uh, reliance on statistical validity of a survey. Um, this is more to get um, identify issues. And you're right, uh, bias can be built in both from the questions and also from the marketing, who's responding. Um, and so we we need to work pretty hard on that. The DEI Commission, um, we met with um, uh, Joe Palumbo and um, Andrea um, just this week, and they um, expressed concern, same concern, Nancy, and have offered to help. Andrea's got um, expertise in this. So I'm hopeful that that's we can in, avoid that problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's not, I, I looked at their survey and it, I don't see us producing something quite like that. We're really just issue interested in flushing out issues. Our, our experience in this has started with in March of 2020 with the, um, uh, uh, we had never done these kinds of surveys with our preservation plans. We've done quite a few, but since 2020, we've been using it. And even though um, we could abandon it, it, it's turned out to be for us, very helpful. It's it's I I hear different voices when I get to go through those qualitative answers to surveys, like what is it like to live in your neighborhood, those kinds of questions. Um, and it's it just it's just helpful. Yeah. So I, I I I would urge all of you to help us with the concern that Nancy's uh, uh, expressing because we're we're very well aware. And of course, Nancy, you're out of the National Park Service, and there are just huge protocols around doing any surveys. Yeah, I'm government. sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I bring that with me. <laughs> Although I will say that the number one finding, as I recall, of the DEI survey was to hire a DEI coordinator. So, uh, so I, that that that's maybe one example of, you know, where we don't want to go. Yeah. Although I'm yeah. sure Anne, Anne might like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Louise, in, in, yeah, I just want to express a word of caution about uh, the DEI survey, because, you know, I think that the DEI survey has a, a very useful purposes, but uh, built in into it, there's a profound bias, which uh, is uh, captured by the fact that, that uh, this was part of a, of, a mo of a movement to say so, or to, or to an initiative to hire a full-time DEI coordinator. And the second thing is that the DEI vis-a-vis -vis the uh, dealings with both the, both the historical commission uh, that I know secondhand, but certainly that I know firsthand from the historic districts commission has entirely failed to articulate a, a policy uh, just about anything. It looks like they want to use uh, all the different commissions in Concord to implement a very particular view that uh, can be maybe very uh, beneficial, but, but certainly it's open to a lot of discussion. So I would be extremely um, skeptical about any conclusions that I take from, uh, from the DEI survey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, 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 I think I've, I've got that. Um... Yeah, um, we can. I, 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 under the the issues that we would like to talk about at the end of the day, I'd like to um, ask Alan and um, uh, Dennis to help us in a conversation about our our meeting that we had earlier this week. Um, and Anne and I have, you know, working on how do we respond um, to involve the DEI committee a uh, commission. So that's that we're bearing that in mind. Thank you, Luis. Anyone else on the survey idea? Okay. I'll just um, put uh, in a comment here. Um, I, um, a month or two ago, Joe Palumbo and Mark Howell, who are the DE, Mark Howell is the uh, liaison to the DEI commission. They came to the CHC, to our commission, um, and they asked if, um, for a representative member to, to sort of be a, an informal liaison from the com historical commission to the DEI commission. And I um, have informally become that. So I have been attending some of their meetings and I, I share the same concerns with Luis and Nancy because even just two days ago, um, for example, they um, talked about their warrant article that they're proposing to town meeting and while they have met with the HDC, they have so far failed to 
um, meet with us. So right. yeah, it's right. problem. Right. And that's a, yeah, problem. We, yeah. We and we will address that. Yeah. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I can tell you that uh, the meeting that we finally had with the HCC, the only suggestions that they had was uh, in updating the the syntax of the uh, rules and regulations. You see, uh, using and uh, you know archaic terms by the select uh, 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 the select men or something like that for things of that sort. You see, they, they, there was absolutely nothing of substance there. So mm -hmm. I remain very skeptical. Thank you. Yeah. Melissa? Um, I just want to say that, you know, in the conversation, my recollection, the conversation about this help of the DEI about this survey was much more in the mechanics. I don't think um, for a minute that the the questions that Elizabeth and Peter, I presume that you will develop some questions and we'll look at it first before it goes out, certainly. Um, it was really about physically how how did they handle it? Did they had a QR code? How did they promote the fact that there is a survey being conducted um, by our preservation consultants, not their content? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. And and actually, just to say, I think their content was quite long. A lot of a lot of questions. Uh, we we prefer not to do that. <laughs> yeah. Melissa. Well, I, I'm trying to lower my hand here. How do? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> I hold my land lower hand. There it goes. There go. <laughs> I just lowered it for you. Okay. I did. Okay. <laughs> uh, Alan, you're exercising control there. Yes. No, I did it all by myself. We're moving. We're moving, we're moving along. Yes. <laughs> I talk with my hands, and if you wave, your hands will sometimes. You you have to have learned to keep my hands low. Um, our second um, effort in in involving the public or involving our stakeholders um, in doing public outreach is is interviews. Um, this is the one-on-one, -on -one, two-on-one kind of idea. In some cases, we might want to just have. Uh, Peter and or I might want to have a confidential conversation with someone, um, but mainly what we're seeing is, is how it's proceeded so far. And we are ahead of time on phase one in this particular task. Um, and as a new member of your staff, um, ask that we um, begin the process in phase one. It's slowing phase one down a little bit and don't feel bad about that. It's not it's not a problem, but we are. Um, learning as we go in both ways, looking at documentation and talking with a few key people so far. And the completed interviews you can see on here, um, Conquer 250, um, uh, Dennis and Luis, uh, incoming outgoing HD chairs, uh, Andre and Joe, as we've mentioned, um, uh, Elizabeth Hughes, uh, Marsha Rasmussen, her predecessor, and Electa Tish, who um, we actually knew, I may have, have that spelling wrong, um, but I, I, uh, I knew, we knew Electa, Peter and I, um, from the Freedom's Way National Heritage Area. It's very helpful. She's a, uh, an archeologist and filmmaker and we um, got insights from everyone on this list so far and we can, we wanna continue doing that. Um, for your participation, we see, we see um, increasing our activity by the end of March. Um, as soon as we can get as much of the phase one writing done as possible, um, and uh, at least in good draft. The, um, and then we would do this throughout April. We do it at, at people's convenience, you know, be nice to batch them if we can. Um, and we see you guys participating. Um, steering committee members, uh, you guys are effectively overall the steering committee, but we've been involving Alan and Melissa in some of these interviews as we've gone along and Dennis as well. And we'd like to keep that available also, although other members of your group could could substitute out if, if it looks interesting for some of you. We'll keep you apprised about how we're planning that. And just as a start on that, um, we are, as I mentioned, um, working up a list of all stakeholders, but I'd be interested in capturing right now with not for attribution from any one of you, although I did do some attribution above in my notes, but it, uh, are there people you feel could contribute, who, who are not on the HDC, it would, um, we're, we're looking at, at doing that um, with you all too, um, but that's, your your input's gonna be on a monthly basis in this meeting. Um, Melissa? Well, so uh, the question I have, because it's about preservation and planning, 
I keep thinking about the whole the group of people like developers in our town, uh, mm -hmm. builders. Um, mm -hmm. You know, John Boynton comes to mind, but there are sure others that members of the folks who are on this uh, call today. Uh, will you be interviewing them? I mean, because I, you know, I think um, they're very much a very important part of the current and future of this town. I agree. We should, we should, we should do that. That's exactly the kind of input we need. Yeah. yeah. And send them personal invitations to take the circuit. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Elizabeth, are you looking for names right now or do you, sure. do you want to send them on? Sure. Yeah, you can think about it, but if you, if something's popping up here that can help the, the discussion, yes, just dr jump in, Dennis. Well, I, I think immediately Joanne Gibson comes to mind as someone uh, uh, who you need to talk to because she's been very involved. And I'm having discussions with her about her concerns about Sudbury Road and the MBTA mandate. And uh, and I think she's going to be leading uh, up an effort there to expand the historic districts. So uh, I think she's a she's been a key player. She also is very involved in save, saving Haywood Meadow. Uh, and she's been involved with the Friends of Brewster's Woods, so she's a key, oh, I think she's a key player. Yeah. Right. Uh, Nancy? I'm just wondering what everyone thinks about um, Holly Kratzley. She has lived in Concord for a long time. She had an architectural, yeah. uh, she's retired now, but and she's been on lots of committees. I, I don't know if it, but what do others think? She might be a good person for that list. I mean, I, I, I've suggested her before. I, I, Nancy, you know her very well, too. She I just, think she'd be great because she sits, uh, she does a lot of work on historic structures. Yep. And so we've had some very interesting conversations about preservation or, <laughs> versus um, partial demolition or whatever. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. think her perspective would be good and well-informed. No, I would agree. I would agree with that. I think she yeah. should be great. And of course, you're going to talk to all the heads of the various uh, historic houses and uh, and institutions in town. I, yeah. I assume that moving along. I think a big question going forward, and when I hear in the community, and as we take a look at the right tavern trying to come online, is what I hear from citizens is how much infrastructure do we need to run all this stuff, and do we need a director for each site, and isn't there some way of coordinating? I particularly hear this from funders who say, do we wow. need to fund another thing in town? So I, I think that's uh, that's an ongoing uh, uh, problem. You hear from, and I don't think this is speaking out of, of turn, but uh, you know the Emersons, the next generation is about to take over the Emerson house, and I'm not sure how uh, engaged the, the kids are there. And I think that uh, uh, I think that there's some concerns there. So that's I think that's a big picture thing uh, that we should really be concerned about. And uh, the head of um, uh, the Orchard House is not going to be a Jan. It's not going to be there forever, and and she's done a fabulous job. So I think there's there's a lot stewing there below the surface that is extremely important for protecting the heritage here. I, I agree. Yes. Very so. Tim. Tim. Uh, I was just going to getting back to builders. Just to add a couple other names. Um, there's a fellow called Fabio Andreda, F A B I O. It's Fabio Construction. And also Mark White, who owns Bentley Construction. Yeah, he yeah uh, he works with Johanna Boynton. I'm sorry. He works with Johanna Boynton. Uh, no, jo Joanne Joanna and John are Mark Mark White's a separate guy. Oh okay. Um. Oh, well, Mark Brennan is the other one. Mark, I'm Mark, 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 Mark Brennan. Brennan. I'm sorry. Yep. Mark yeah. Brennan is the builder for for uh, Boynton, Boynton Brennan. Brennan. Yep. Yep. So anyway, um, thank you. The other one, I don't, uh, is Mike Bush now? He comes up to these, um, he's come no. before the, um, you know, for demolition delay requests on several occasions already. Yeah, Mike's a good guy and he knows a lot of what's going on in town. I, I don't know, you know, he's in, uh, invested as much as some of the other builders, but, but sure, yeah. everyone, you know, yeah. we're, or even like Lunig. You know, um, Dick Lunig. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Who's been around for ages? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I was thinking of him. Yeah. So we 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 could prepare a list. Absolutely. 
Yeah, that would be great. We'll, we'll yeah. get you started with the list I've got and you all keep adding to it. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Just to sort of emphasize the builder, developer, especially developers, the people who are listing are builders and developers, mostly developers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a huge mm -hmm. impact on the town. I know all three guys. Um, and one of them asked me, why would you join the historic district commission? <laughs> uh, so, and he's a guy I like a lot and respect. So I think there's a, you know, there's a, a disconnect and uh, between in, in intention. Uh, I think all these people have good and in, good intentions and feel like they're doing good work, but there's a, you know, there's, there's, a, I think there's always been a conversation there that I've never had the courage to have with these guys because it's a, it's a very touchy subject, but um, it'd be great to engage them uh, in meaningful conversations because there's a lot of impact uh, going on sure. in the town. Yeah. And, 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 and regulation is uh, going to slow them down, but I, I always have in the back of my head as a preservation planner that the reason people want to build in your community is the quality of the character of the community and you all are principal guardians of that and respecting that process is part of i think uh, uh, good citizen builders if i should say um mm. other other sort of uh usual suspects either topics or names that don't don't, don't well, necessarily have to be I, yeah i i can add one of the the usual suspects uh, which is uh probably exactly the opposite this the side of the spectrum of the builders which is uh, Brian Rossborough. You know, I don't know if you have encountered him, but he's been here for a long, long time. He has opinions on everything and all of his opinions are quite rational and you may or may not agree with them, but at least he gives a, a, a legitimate perspective about what uh, he's being asked for or what he's talking about. And 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 you're saying is is this in support of preservation or in well, support of change? No, he he's in support of preservation, and he's also in support of change if it fits the purposes of uh, keeping the historic references. Uh, he and I had long conversations when the right tavern came up uh, for uh, relaunching. <laughs> And, uh, you know, he had all kinds of ideas, uh, and certainly none of them was uh, to put it uh, on a freezer and keep it as it was. You see, he had all kinds of interesting ideas that were all historically consistent, you know. <laughs> I, sure. Nancy? I once had um, occasion to catch um, uh, Brian with uh, Tom Wilson of Wright Tavern. And I was joking with them. Uh, neither of them has ever had a small idea. This is true. The one couple we haven't mentioned yet are uh, Anna Winter and Neil Rasmussen. Oh, uh, my, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who uh, provided a, a lot of, of means to, and been very directly involved in a lot of what gets saved in Concord. So, and that's Friends of Concord. Do I have that right? Yeah. yeah no, what have, no uh, save our heritage. Save our heritage. Save our heritage. Sorry. Save our heritage. Save our, <laughs> I think they're on the list I've given you. Yes. Yes, I remember. In fact, we did try uh, to get Anna. Yeah, um, we, we still uh, will try. conversation, and yeah. we'll keep trying. Yeah. 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 Very good. Okay. All right. Um, well, this what what we're about to do will maybe give you more ideas, and um, you know, uh, we we want also to conduct focus groups, and that's where we take multiple people um, and ask them to come in to talk together, um, and you often get very interesting conversations because they sort of rub up against each other and and contribute you know contribute to each other's thinking, um, and so we see doing these focus groups for uh, uh, twice, um, once in issue identification phase, which is what phase two is helping us do and what phase one is helping us do. Um, and then going back to them with our ideas for recommendations, um, that would be in the summer. Um, but for right now, we need to figure out how to form this. And these are the four, we have five uh, proposed topics. It's a little bit more than we would 
uh, in some communities, but we feel pretty strongly this is needed. Um, the first would be to talk through historic preservation programming in, in Concord, how, as it exists, as it needs to change, how it's being experienced. We, I'm saying it's the full panoply of standard policies and programs that relate to pres preservation, historic districts, uh, inventories, um, National Register nominations, the whole nine yards, not including public education. That's a different topic. And the second topic, these are alphabetical, no, no particular order, um, economic vitality and tourism. Um, we've been specifically asked to look at heritage tourism. Um, we always do like to talk to members of the business community about how they're experiencing historic preservation programs and contributing to the visitor experience. Um, and we think here that we would add attract we would ask attractions to come in twice, once on this topic and once on public awareness and interpretation, which I'll get to in just a minute. But the, the economic vitality and tourism would be to get um, a good conversation going on visitor experience. How does visitor experience support preservation and public awareness of historic and cultural resources? You're all doing um a lot of good work in that area. The investment in tourism in Concord is impressive. Um, and uh, obviously the 250th coming up, we don't see this plan, by the way, affecting the 250th commission. Um, that's a totally different thing. We're way out of time for that. Um, you know, our plan, they're going to be, they're starting their work. You know, events I expect will be starting in the fall um, to help lead up to your anniversary next year. So I think we've got, um, you know, plenty to do without worrying about that, talking about the sort of long-term um, issues of tourism and how to sustain economic vitality. Our general view of economic development in historic communities is that you need um, fiscal sustainability for your municipal government and you need um, uh, resources and change to invest in your properties. Um, maybe you're getting a little bit more change than you, you would you would like to see in the case of some of the new housing that's getting built, but um, a prosperous community can invest in historic preservation is our bottom line when we look at that topic. So we'd like to hear from people who are involved directly in those in those areas. Um, uh, the third, and I think a very big one, is public awareness and interpretation. The DEI conversation earlier this week with Alan, Dennis, and Melissa, um, and, and then we also had um, um, Lisa Stricker, who is a consultant working with the town on their internal DEI policy development. Um, yes, your mission, uh, the CHC's mission, it, it's interesting to work with two of you. In many communities, the functions that the two bodies that I'm talking to now is combined in one body. And they often get, um, because it's sort of relentless monthly weekly, bi-weekly, whatever duty, the COA, Certificate of Appropriateness type of process where you approve, um, you do design review, uh, overwhelms many communities um, and they don't get to the public education piece. Here you've got a, a body that's um, uh, devoted to, to that and you have some very specific language about how you are to do, the CHC is to do educational activities. Um, you're not responsible for how the story is told in Concord, particularly, but it, it it's that's hinted at in your mission. I would I would assert, um, and I think what you can be doing is asking how do the interp the the people who are in charge of interpreting sites and stories what do they need, and how can you help them get that those resources um, and the diversity of the stories is a, a big issue for your community has already been on, you know, your front pages. Um, and so how do, how do you, how do you participate in that without taking responsibility for it? I think that's an important piece of this. You're busy with a lot of things um, and getting tangled up in making sure that someone's doing the research um, and telling the stories in a particular way. You're not going to be the guardians of that. You're a participant in that conversation, you're a resource, um, and you may be able to provide some uh, leadership, particularly with regard to resources. The, the, um, your mission actually mentions um, research is a kind of funny word in your, in your mission and CHC's mission now I'm saying you. Um, and 
one of the things that is needed is rather than picking a story you want to tell and diving into your history, there's a lot of history that's just simply not uncovered that would inspire stories to arise from good research. And so there are two different ways of looking at that. And, and I think um, encouraging greater research through surveys, through National Register nominations at the least, and perhaps in other ways, uh, you're allowed to, to do books and pamphlets and those kinds of things. Are there ways to do that? Anne's been participating um, with the uh, tourism folks on the map that's been done for Concord, um, for, for visitors. And, and so that kind of participation, you can contribute. So it, it, we're, we're walking a fine line here between asking the questions about how is the story being told the real reason that we're interested in this is to build greater public appreciation for the historic resources that illustrate Concord's development in as broad and diverse a way as possible. Um, and so, you know, your that get no respect conversation is part of group C here, public awareness and interpretation. How do you educate the public about your resources? How do you interpret it and tell the stories that that help bring to life the historic structures that you have resources that you have in your landscape so that's a that, i'm going to stop here and see if you've got comments about this one no sounds good okay all right um open space and natural resources one of the things that shines through brightly in your surveys of the 1990s um, with ann um more so really than the the west concord one although it's 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 there in both is is the value of your uh, landscape at large. And um, I, I, we want to talk to people who are involved in caring for uh, natural landscapes, the landscapes that are part of the historic and cultural landscape, um, and how they do their work and what is needed and how they recognize historic resources within their work. So that's a, a, a fairly big conversation. We are having, a, a, you notice the, the word indigenous advisor here, I should have mentioned earlier. Um, the town has um, uh, employed a member of the, help me in, Hanamas Sika, um, Nipmuc tribe, Nipmuc band, um, who are the um, Nipmuc um, tribal um, group that, that you would be working with most directly on telling indigenous stories, on identifying indigenous resources. Um, archaeology is going to be a big topic um, for you in several of these in Group A on preservation processes as well as as, as in this one and how how we can do better on archaeology in Concord. So that's um, the and then the last is planning in Concord alignment with historic preservation. We are always asking how does historic preservation get expressed in other activities of the town. I once upon a time taught historic preservation planning for about four years as an adjunct for the University of Virginia. And I had kids by the fourth year coming in because it was a survey, it was a planning survey, a survey of all planning topics. Because I would take a topic and say, how do you find historic preservation in transportation, housing, um, taxation, uh, uh, any number of different topics that you don't necessarily think of as part of the historic preservation canon but they have great um, impact. And how do you align those programs? How can you take advantage of those programs to support your work? And so we'd like to have that conversation as well. I didn't actually get the desired participants into this, into this column yet, but obviously I think you guys are a, a part of the desired participants in this, as well as members of other town committees. One of the things I noticed in the, uh, Alan? I'm, I was just gonna back up to D where, yeah. where uh, for instance, what, what what we think uh, for natural open spaces, uh, would we run into any conflicts with the uh, state of Massachusetts? You know, for instance, the Battle Road, um, what we think mm, should mm -hmm. preserve, um, or, you know, uh, the airport, you know, Hanscom, um, issues like that. And and who's who's going to take precedence, right, when, when conversations come up? You know, I, I think that I think we might run into some situations. What we think is what we want to see preserved and what, what they want to see preserved might be two different things. Yes, um, indeed. And it's, it was interesting and mentioned to me just yesterday that um, Hanscom is 
constantly wanting to do its expansion. So they keep updating their information about historic resources, but they're only interested in what's already listed in the National Register. That's not right because you're supposed to, if anyone who is administering federal or state funds is supposed to be dealing with eligible resources as well as listed resources. And so, yeah, I, you know, I hadn't thought, thank you, Alan. I hadn't really thought about that. I think definitely the open space and natural resources, people would be interested in talking about that, but that, that also belongs in your preservation programs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how, how do you interface with the state um, and to the extent that's involved the federal government, obviously Minuteman. Um, and um, I'd be interested in further thoughts about that from you guys. How do you, how do we think about Hanscom? Um, obviously, I think we would want Anna Winter, who's, I, I think, um, Save Our Heritage is a, a leader in the, the fight against Hanscom. And I've seen, we've seen documentation on what's going on there. Um, we'd like to get more perspective on it. Um, you know, <laughs> I had a conversation with with uh, Nancy at the top of my screen um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, about, you know, are you a world heritage site? You know, are you a, are you a cultural landscape of such importance that the agencies that are charged with making decisions about the spending of federal and state money to do these activities? Is it wrong that they would make a decision? See, the, the problem is, is that this is an environmental review issue. And the dirty secret of historic preservation at the national level and the whole Section 106 that you may have heard of, that's, that's our nickname for environmental review involving historic resources, is that the agencies themselves who are administering the funds, the grants, the licenses, the permits, have the ultimate ability to decide, as long as they have sufficiently considered those resources. You may, if you've done any environmental review work, you may have heard the same thing in the environmental review, the same deal. Both to, In both cases, agencies can make the decision. Um, it's just when they trip things up, um, for example, the pipeline out in the Midwest um, where the um, really ugly situation where um, they completely ignored indigenous resources altogether. And there were tribal officers and state historic preservation officers who could have advised in that, and they simply just rolled right through. Well, they lost their permit because they didn't consider those resources. Had they considered it, they might have been able to do exactly what they're doing now, horribly. Um, so, you know, I'm giving away my my. <laughs> um, biases, but I'm a preservation planner, so there. Um, but that's yes, that is, you know, that's a big question for Hanscom, and right. you guys. I mean, I don't know what we do in the pre preservation plan. If there's anything that we have to like write up separately and specially for you in that, sometimes we do like sub chapters um, where we really explain that. Um, you know, it's it's um, it's a fight. Yeah. I mean, you, it was comparatively easy to save Walden, <laughs> Walden Woods. I'm sorry, uh, you know, as awful yeah. as that sounds. Yeah. Nancy? Yeah. So I had a couple of things on D2. Um, I just, I know we all think this way, but it's natural and cultural resources. The cultural landscape is very, very important around here. And you can't call agriculture a natural resource necessarily. So that's that's one thing. And another interesting thing is the land trusts. Um, Several land trusts are now in serious conversations with Native people about their access to and use of land trust properties. And some of them have gone quite a long way in opening their doors to traditional ceremonies and uses. And then the last one, don't forget, uh, E, don't forget mm -hmm. roads. Don't forget roads in E. Ah. Yes, state byways. Transportation, the Route 2 corridor is now going to be looked at. And uh, Route 2A, of course, Alan's already referred to that. Um, and the realignment of Virginia Road many years ago, which was one of the town's oldest roads and just straightened it out and changed it up. You know, so. apropos of what Nancy just saying, you know, the scenic roads, we did get nine roads um, included as part of our scenic roads, but we can go back to the town, but we, you know, uh, to nominate additional roads. So that would be another thing for you to help us identify. Yeah, that's a good um, one. And I, I just have a little aside, you know, we, um, we've been working with Anna and all, um, and Alan and I particularly, um, 
nominating Minuteman and envi the env environment, environment, what we're saying. And that really is, is the other historic properties in the area to be nominated once again as one of America's 11 most endangered historic sites. And uh, right. we, have, we are moving along in the process. Um, they actually came to us, you know, as it, it was nominated and was designated, uh, what, Nancy, in 2003 or four, something oh. already, uh, never came off the list. And a question to you, is there anything you could do to help uh, us be sure we're gonna get it? Is there, do you have any- I don't know. Um, I, I, I would think that some of you might have more influence than Peter and I. Um, we can we will talk behind the scenes on yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Anna, you know, for sure. Anna, I mean, yeah. it's just done an amazing job. She's, you know, I get an email every now and then saying, "Can you get, send me something?" That, you know, she's documenting it with, you know. So, anyway, hoping. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So these are these are five topics. I, I, I you know, Hanscom is a special case. Um, I love the, the addition of the scenic roads. Thank you very much. Did you say Virginia Road was realigned? Is that was that in relation to Hanscom? Do I have that right? No, no, no. Okay. Um, uh, I don't remember the exact details. I think it was just um, sometimes engineers don't like a crooked line. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it was all that industrial development or business office development at the end that drove it. Ah. Uh, that that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. and remember, they took over that huge farm, and then they uh, saved the farmhouse, but then they built all around it with the office right. building. Oh, yes, that, that was Basil Chigas's family farm, right? Yeah, I'm not. I don't remember. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That was a big farm. Yeah. It also reminds me, you know, there's a transportation advisory committee here in town, um, Peter and Elizabeth. That, um, you know, they're they're exploring a whole lot of options for the town. And I think one of the topics I presume would be complete streets, yeah, which is a, a concern. Um, what does that really mean? What will that mean for a lot of the roads? Some, some are that are historic that are not protected by the scenic roads bylaw. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, one of the other pieces, and I don't know where it fits in on here and I was going to sort of save it, but that is something that I've, I'm sort of working on, and that there is no comprehensive updated history of the town. Ruth, oh. Wheeler, Ruth Wheeler was the last one. I think Melissa wasn't. Isn't Ruth Wheeler oh. the last comprehensive history? Well, you know, uh, Bob Gross has done a lot of work. There are pieces. A lot of pieces have been done, but nothing's ever been put into a comprehensive history of the town that the citizens can have that's updated and uh, uh, and meaningful. Actually, I was sort of hoping that out of this. <laughs> Preservation plan that would uh, be covered. I mean, not book length, but uh, clearly what's missing. If you look, you know, in the in the two thousand one historic master plan, which you've referred to, um, Elizabeth, the even that um, re relatively concise history of the town of Concord does not do his service at all. It doesn't include the enslaved African American population. It doesn't really do much about indigenous people. So much in what you were saying that, you know, or Anne said earlier, in the past 20 years, we've learned a lot. Well, that is a big gap yeah. in the history, even associated with the, of the planning document. Mm -hmm. And a lot of new research that's been done just in general uh, that that uh, really needs to be incorporated in something more comprehensive. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes. Ah, I, I'm, I'm in pain because this is something that some scholars should have seen several years ago and be working toward mm. the deadline yeah. of Christmas this year, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can't believe that that's not happening. Yeah. I, um, David Wood at the Concord Museum, he is working on a publication because of course for the 250th, the museum will have special exhibitions. So he's covering part of that. I've been doing a lot of work. I'm sure you've heard about the tercentenary markers and mm -hmm. thinking about what those signs, you know, they covered the early earliest history, the the foundation of the of the colonial town, and I've been analyzing all, or reviewing all of the literature, and that's just become a huge highlight for me. That really, there's a lot of misinformation even in um, Wheeler's book. Yeah, um, stories have been perpetuated, and and things have been perpetuated that are not have not been corrected. And of course, this has already been pointed out. All the you know I indigenous history. Um, and and uh, enslaved history has been just left out. 
So it is to me really surprising that um, that new research has not a new book, you know, we can't just have something short. It needs to be, you know, a Bob Gross kind of yeah, full yeah. thing. And, and, you know, when I worked on, I worked on a group with the old man, uh, yeah, the old man's. And I realized that too, the old man's is so important and they don't even have, you know, a book about the old man's. And <laughs> if I had more energy, that's one topic that I would do. I would just take that up as a topic. It could be, you know, PhD topic, the whole comprehensive history of the old man's, which actually incorporates, you know, every subject in the town too. Um, mm -hmm. So th there's really a need for a lot of research. Um, so their younger scholars should be taking this up. It's a great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Anne? Right. So I just wanted to mention, you know, that the tour guides have a, there's a, um, you know, a course that's offered to the tour guides. And so their, their document is the, um, the Leslie Perrin Wilson, um, you know, book, uh, Historic Concord and the Lexington Fight. So I think that's probably the most up-to-date um, book currently, and it, it really just highlights uh, particular you know, particular attractions. Um, but it, it's a great book, and it does, you know, cover a pretty good, it, it gives you a good, pretty good overview. Wow. Well, you guys are gearing me up for trying anyway. I mean, we're supposed to be giving you... Uh, a, a statement of um, how Concord developed and how we can see history in the landscape, you know, each layer reflecting uh, the times, technology changes, political changes, whatever, military actions, a, a whole host of factors contribute to the marvelous landscape that you have. And we want to tease out enough. So, and, and really the 2001 plan does this as well. Um, you need illustrations and maps to go with something like that. Um, you know, even understanding the um, geology, soils, the uh, sort of natural landscape of, of Concord, you need some maps to illustrate that. Yeah. So we can we can definitely help, I, I think, uh, point the way maybe. Um, and you, you've <laughs> laid a challenge before Peter and me. <laughs> well, the, the document, the, the context we need to prepare is about the physical development of the town. I think that the points you're raising are recommendations that need to be addressed for which grants may be available um, and need to be much more in depth looking at people's and and and, and social history. Yeah. So I think that comes out of the plan is that you prioritize it, but we set the recommendations. So we need to hear from you what you what's been determined that's missing, indigenous history and and so on. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, thank you, Dennis. That, that was very helpful. Um, so uh, that's, I'm conscious of our time. We have 20 minutes left. And so we're looking at doing a, groupings over one week, possibly two weeks, depending on how, how much we want to do afternoon versus evening for the convenience of the participants. There's sort of all the, you know, um, we would like at least one from the CHC to participate in each of the five focus groups. For the HDC, we'd like for you to be involved in the historic preservation one. That's Group A in the um, in Group C, which is your public awareness and interpretation, and last but hardly least, alignment with historic preservation, um, uh, aligning other town activities. Um, DEI, by the way, is is not to be separated out. It is something to. Um, include throughout all of the discussions. How is diversity reflected? in all of the activities that are being uh, planned for in this historic preservation plan, how it can it be encouraged. Um, the indigenous, indigenous advisor will be helpful partly in that. Um, and I would hope that DEI commissioners can also be helpful in having that conversation. Um, we're, we're not, um, I think that is a principle that I, I, I sat through the conversation uh, that Nancy Frizzell Lee mentioned of uh, the meeting with the H HDC um, and uh, the comment by the HDC that left was most impressive to me, it was a very impressive conversation altogether, very, um, I think, thoughtful, um, was that it isn't just you guys who need to be cognizant of DEI, it's every town commission. And so what are the general principles? We are thinking in that same way for these kinds of focus groups, that that's a conversation that we should have at every opportunity um, to simply just glean uh, information and perspectives 
from anyone who's participating in this because we all are custodians of um, our perspective and uh, interested in others' perspectives and how we have the, that conversation is important. Um, so that's a point I wanted to make. I am, by the way, um, sitting in on Melissa's uh, historical topics forum and the tourism huddle is a nice group. We might even be able to use that group as our as our group, um, you know, for tourism and, and uh, uh, historic preservation. So um, and and development. Um, so I, I just wanted to quickly um, point you to sections. I'm not going to read this, but the sections there. These three activities that we just talked about: the community survey, um, the focus groups, and the stakeholder interviews are uh, described in our scope under tasks 1.5. 2.1 and that is it. Um, so those, so there's, and, and we really love the focus group piece of it. Um, it, it I, I hope this is gonna be sufficient to get good dialogue. Um, if you think of other things that we might be doing, let's talk about it now or offline uh, with Ann. Um, and is there any way to improve this public outreach plan? We will finalize this document and send it to each of you. And again, comments back to Anne um, so that we can continue to consider how we're how well we're doing this. Um, the fourth topic is public workshops. We see one, um, this is wrong uh, time frame for round two. Uh, this is a one of those wonderful things that happens with word processing. Um, the public workshop is something that we'd like to hold at the end of May no later than the middle of June. Um, people travel, um, people are busy in the summer, and um, so we need, to, we need to aim for getting a good public meeting with a presentation by Peter and me on, you know, what our findings are, what we've learned, um, the direction that we see um, heading, the contents of the plan, all of that kind of thing. Um, and we have a very, task 2.2 describes the first public workshop and we also in task 3.4, which is you know beyond this phase that we've been talking about, the second public uh, workshop. And that's where we also commit to a second round of focus groups. Um, so you know, I just wanted to end with this piece here. Where are we headed with the results of this outreach phase? We are, um, our, our key task is to come up with preservation plan strategies and recommendations, working with you guys. Um, looking at re recommendations for historic property inventories, national register, public awareness, municipal bylaws and recommendations, anything that comes up out, that arises from all of these discussions needs to be captured in some way in the list of recommendations. And as I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, it's a little unusual, but you all have such a good list already of recommendations that we'd love to get kind of in advance, you know, maybe a month from now. Um, ask mm -hmm. you guys to just just look over those um, and and give us some comments on that as well. So questions, comments about the public outreach plan. We have 15 more minutes and maybe we can get to a little bit more discussion, but I just wanted to um, make sure you guys are completely briefed on this. No, nope, that's good. Okay, Alan, thank you very uh, much. Yeah, okay. When, when, when are you looking for a representative um, from each of the groups? When? Uh, when are you looking to do that? I, I think as we're scheduling it so that you guys okay. have, you know, it, because it's, it, you know, if somebody's not able to participate, I don't want to tag them with the responsibility because they're out of town or something. Um, so we need to, you know, let's let's keep talking about that as the schedule okay. evolves. We need to have uh, in between these monthly meetings with you, we, we will have other kinds of communications. Um, so I, I, um, we have three topics here, and um, we've covered a lot. Um, one of the, and we have the three topics, Alan, as, as time allows is how I've made a note for myself. And that is, this one topic is cooperation between the CHC and HTC. These are topics that we can pick up at, at another time too. Um, what's, what's most uppermost in your mind for final discussion here? Second is promoting historic preservation of Concord residents. Um, and third, just simply other thoughts, key issues, challenges, questions, solutions you want to offer. Some of that's already come up in this discussion, but if you have anything specific, um, my suggestion would be just to talk uh, about promoting historic preservation to Concord residents, actually. Uh, I'd skip over the CHC and HDC and let you guys have that conversation with us next month. Sound okay? Okay. Yeah. So, All right. So, so 
further thoughts about historic preservation, promoting historic preservation of Concord residents. This is the shorthand get no respect conversation. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see. How do we fix that? <laughs> it would be interesting to see what comes up in these discussions about the people who live here because it's a nice community, but they don't understand why it's a nice community. Uh, and but they don't really like tourists because they sort of fill up the town and they get in the way and you know uh, um, versus you know versus those people who just want to live in a nice town and I think there's there's always been a certain amount of tension and the phrase is we're not Williamsburg you know that's uh, you know mm -hmm. that's that's what you hear all the time so it'll be I'll be intrigued to find out how that comes out in this study. But in the other another phrase is you know we're not Sudbury, you know that is, oh. Yeah. Oh, know. yeah. Right. right. That's usually right. why. Well, what? What? Tell me more. Seems to have had very little historic preservation or, you know, pockets of it here and there. And it's bigger anyway. And it's that much closer to Boston as Route 20. I don't even know if it has Route 9, but definitely has 20. So it's, it's a different sort of town anyway. But um, it's got a lot of, you know, sort of stone veneer clad houses and things like that. And so. That's Un unfortunate hmm. architecture. Yes. <laughs> so I that and I hear that in times, you know, this is my third historic district that I've served on. And they're, they're all pretty interchangeable about how the public feels about them, which is when they're going before them, they can't stand them. But as soon as their neighbor builds something, they don't like it's like where was the hdc you know and i frequently have to say that's not in a district or you know something comes up and where's the hdc on this the prison which is nowhere near any of our districts you know what's the oh. hdc going to do about that i hope the hdc is going to save that old building mm -hmm. so it's that's pretty consistent in the public or, or, or i don't i don't want concord to go the way of lexington yeah, no. jay, Ky jay kaiser is the town el Elder keeps saying, if we're not careful, we're going to become Wellesley. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the other side. Of the, and we see it here in town, for instance. I mean, Joanne Gibson has been fighting sidewalks on the uh, along, uh, uh, along Haywood Meadow for years. And this whole question of how many curbs do we want? Is that too uh, civilized? What yeah. about dirt sidewalks versus bricks? You know, this whole question of infrastructure and how that reflects the, you know, the, the, the the, the town and its feelings about itself. You know? yeah. case, case in point, Hubbard Street. Yeah. Right. We'll take you down Hubbard Street, Elizabeth, and try to describe sure. what it used to look like. So, okay. Well, you know, I sat on HDC when the when when we got gave permission to do uh, some of that work, and it, it was a big mistake. We should have not because they claimed that you know the people are endangered cutting across uh, uh, cutting across uh, uh, Walden Street. Uh, do you think they're cutting across any less now that they have curb cuts and uh, uh, <laughs> and sidewalks? No, they still cut across, but now we have fancy sidewalks. So there was this whole question of public safety, which drives a mm -hmm. lot of decisions in the town mm -hmm. uh, against preservation. Well, that's mm -hmm. why I bring up the Transportation Advisory Committee and the notion of complete streets. This Absolutely. what what is going? What do they mean by that in Concord? What? Right. You know, and, and as Nancy says, that you know, the engineers of public works would just as soon have a straight road because it's a lot easier to plow to maintain instead right. of a well, road that curves. That's going to become more evident when they redo the intersection at the center at, at Walden and Main Street. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that'll be that'll be interesting. There's also, if you notice, there's not a single curve in town. They don't want to put up big yellow signs telling you there's a curve there. There's a curve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking them how many people have been killed on that curb. I've I've not even seen an accident there in 20 years. But you got to have big signs telling them that this is a curb there, and so they're popping up all over town. Yeah, I'd like to add one thing, and that is, um, I guess it's been three or four years now, uh, where there was a a group that wanted to expand the historic district, right. um, and that got shot down so quickly it was unbelievable people do not want to put their homes in the historic district and have all these rules and regulations about how they can expand and how they can't change the windows and how come they can't take the chimney down etc it's at let alone the cost of i mean really i think a lot of it's economics they realize it's or assume 
but it's mostly true. It's going to cost you a lot more to own an older home um, than another home that's brand new or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a hard thing to get around, actually. Um, there are sections of town that would be very nice to, well, so Bay Road just was brought up earlier. Um, there are some homes on that street close to town that should be in the historic district that are not. Um, and so I don't know quite how you get around this, but I do think it's a, a pretty serious issue. Well, your 2001, your 2001 plan had the answer or one answer. I, I'm not sure I can say that there's any others, but, and that is something called a conservation district, which is where you allow the neighborhood that's designating, asking to be designated, they create their own rules and they deal with what they're most concerned about. Um, you know, in, in one case that we were familiar with, it was the size of outbuildings, uh, accessory structures being built in the neighborhood um, and setbacks and height and stuff like that, that had, it wasn't uh, getting down to the level of detail that an HDC does, but it does keep the worst from happening, one might think. Um, so we can have that conversation further, Melinda. Is that, um, does that answer suggest a direction to have a conversation? Yeah, that might have been in, in place when this was going on, but I don't recall it ever really being mentioned that they could just sort of do what they want if they wanted to. Um, I, I And there are a lot of people who, there are homes that we wouldn't really consider to be um, really historical, but they're in a neighborhood that is, but they don't want the whole neighborhood to be turned into, you know, say a cul-de-sac, we have one like that. Uh, because they know their house is going to be a teardown, and yet it won't be allowed to be a teardown if they're all of a sudden in a historical district, even if it's I'm a... Not, I, I think a conservation district does not have to prevent demolition. That's a radical idea. I know when you all hear district, you think no demolition. But what you would be doing is protecting against the design of what gets built. And right. I'm not sure how design review works outside of your historic districts. There's a little bit, I know in West Concord and, and there's more for me to learn, Peter and me to learn. Um, but that's, that's you know, I mean, you can sort of, you know, throw out the window, the model of the local historic district and start thinking about, well, what would work? You know, how can we help you think through that? And I uh, thank you for raising that. Although actually, Melinda, were you thinking of the one around the library? I'm thinking of the one on, um, uh, actually, uh, not Belknap, but um, uh, more around the like behind the library when they were getting kind of panicked about the library expansion. That one, no, mm -hmm. talking really? about um, essentially across from the train station, but in Concord Center, but one of those roads that right that's like right across, mm -hmm. right in the middle yeah. of town there. Oh, when we, when we sent out the survey because there was, yeah. There was Two yeah. neighborhoods that approached us. So there, there hmm. were, you know, like about four or five years ago, we had a little run of expanding the district in a way. We reached out to the one that's the one I think Melinda's referring to, but we had Hubbard Street near, um, mm -hmm. you know, up near the top of Hubbard Street approach us because they were afraid a neighbor was going to tear a building down. So there was a handful of neighbors that had kind of gotten together among themselves saying like, oh, let's just join the um, well, the Thorough Street District. And mm -hmm. uh, then they did. Then that neighbor said they weren't going to tear the house down. In fact, they did. Well, a beautiful they, because they came before the Historical Commission yeah, and, and we denied them um, a, a demolition permit, but also partly because those neighbors that you refer to came in on mass to the um, hearing. And and as a result of that, the owner decided not to tear it down and then uh, move it. So yeah, so they withdrew then. And then another neighborhood um, of mid-century houses, Jenny Dugan Road, yeah. yes. and, you know, kind of down in the, sort of the opposite where there are no historic districts in the opposite end yeah. uh, of, that's, of Concord. That's a sad story. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that's, and, that's, and that's like Conantum. Also, right. Mm -hmm. Also, mid-century um, has been mentioned. Um, yeah, Tim, Conantum was in fact identified in your two thousand and one plan. Mm -hmm. Tim, Tim's uh, had his hand up for a while. Sorry, no. sorry, Tim. Tim. Just a slightly different topic, um, and 
very quick story. When the first day I moved into Concord, my neighbor said, this is not Lexington or Wellesley. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of knew that, but I had to figure out, I, I do actually do believe that it's, we're a different town, a better town. I shouldn't say that. It's just, funny. Uh, but uh, my, my point, uh, I, I, a question I want to have is um, the thing that I've noticed you know, the 20 plus years, 23 years I've been here, obviously we've had enormous numbers of teardowns. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the item that, um, I don't know if this gets covered or not, but the issue of lighting um, is a is a huge topic in my mind. And it just, we just had a discussion about lighting a church in the HTC a couple of nights ago. Yeah, and, I saw that. Um, and, and through all the information on the benefits of dark skies, and the damage it does to bird flight, et cetera, et cetera. There's only, unfortunately, because of the lighting industry and lighting designers and landscape, the proliferation of landscape design, there's yeah. just an enormous amount of landscape lighting and tree lighting. And um, anyway, so I'm just, I don't know if that folds in, but it just, it, it is an enormous impact on the town. So maybe there's Williamsburg colors and Concord lights. It's, I think it's a huge issue. I, I'm really happy to hear there's somebody else besides me that's really agitated about this problem. It's terrible from natural point of view as well as just the character of the town. Uh, we, we, you know, we have very tight controls in HTC districts. You step one, one house over and it's, it's uh, almost out of control. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Live next door. Uh, Nancy, Priscilla Lee. Um, hi, yeah, I have two two unconnected comments. One, in this this discussion, made me think about realtors um, that you might want to put in a focus group or you know or, or interview. I served on the HDC when I first moved here, and um, and I remember you know the confusion. I, I still listen in from time to time, but um, I think that people. Um, are are not people who move here don't necessarily understand the the history here. It takes took me a long time to really get my so much history here, right? And I always thought, wow, that that maybe realtors that maybe there should be a booklet put together by the HGC. That there is a of course a booklet, um, you know that that the HGC the guidelines that they have, but that realtors when houses are sold or or even offered, they should give prospective owners and or buyers. That booklet, so that people know that they're, um, you know, what they're that you know it's a responsibility that and um, and the you know the the other thing is about pub, you know we're talking about public awareness how to educate the public I I think every this is so obvious to everybody on this conversation and I I say this at almost every meeting Concord isn't Lexington or Wellesley or any well Lexington maybe but we we do have this just extraordinary history that goes beyond other towns and it really does create um, a dilemma that we can, how do we, you know, we're talking about welcoming. How do we, how do, how can people move to this town who can't afford it? It's a very exclusive town um, and it, it, it's a dilemma. We want more affordable housing and, uh, you know, there's a, and I want it too. Um, I don't think this is a, a diverse town and I, it bothers me more and more every day, the longer I live here. Um, but how do you get people to appreciate the specialness? How do you get out broad education? I don't know. It's, a, it's something that just really concerns me. How do we get Concordians interested in, in their own history in a way that doesn't, I don't know. It, it's the other thing I want to ask you, make sure that you keep the coming buildings. This is another separate uh, topic, but the coming building on the traffic circle in mind because of the, all the, you know, um, publicity about selling the, the, the prison moving rather relocating and the coming building house is very important. We, our commissions need to keep a close eye on what happens to that. It's owned by the state, but it's really, and it's historic. Um, it's on, you know, it's a, uh, the historic register of places, but the, the plaque is on the back of the house. So most people don't know what it is and the plaque it's, it's hidden. Um, so it's not really mm. again in public consciousness what that house is, and it's a really important, it's very important to Concord's history. Um, is it's there a split. committee? How is this? How is the town responding to the prison's uh -huh. shutdown? 
that, uh, that goes way beyond us and uh, right. we should tie into whatever's happening you know um, if linda is still on the call linda could you weigh in on that linda's on the select board mm -hmm. Um, yes, I, I can say a few things about that. Um, there is, um, there was immediate uh, reaction by many people in town when they first heard the information. There are all kinds of ideas that are already being put on the table, but we're very early in the process. Um, on March 1st, I believe it is, um, the League of Women Voters is um, going to have a um, one of their topics on, on MCI, and they've invited some state legislatures to participate, um, as well as uh, Lee Smith from CHCD. So, um, and the select board has just um, is keeping up with Megan um, Zamudo, um, the assistant town manager, who is trying to at least keep a high level tracking of what we know for sure at this point. And sometimes um, that is a result of various meetings that have been held by uh, staff people in town with um, respective state and other agencies. So I think um, that gives you some summary. Very early in the process, and there's all kinds of ideas that are out there. I myself threw out the idea that um, Melissa actually uh, uh, inspired um, to at, at least add to the early list when I, uh, some initial ideas were being thrown out in terms of I hope we can preserve those buildings um, mm -hmm. in some fashion. So um, at, just to get the historic aspect of it uh, uh, on the list. So, so lots will unfold, uh, I think, in the next couple months, we hope. So I, I could I, I'm going to look for the, this resource. A, a colleague of mine in the preservation world did a study for the state of Maryland on all of its facilities, um, many of which are in abandoned shape. Um, there's not it, there's nothing smooth about decommissioning these kinds of properties. Um, and, you know, if there's not a process already in place in Massachusetts, maybe that's a part of what you need. And, you know, I mean, do they get to, are they required to offer you property? you know, the town that is, uh, um, and, you know, how, how does that all work? I mean, in military terms, you know, base realignment stuff with federal uh, bases, there's a whole process. We don't have that, I don't believe, for many states for their major properties. Uh, we do have that in Massachusetts. Um, the, the DCAM uh, deals with the decommissioning. And so um, that is on our radar in terms of who's being spoken with. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Alan, we've gone over time here. Um, what would you we like to do? We, you know, we could really keep going for another couple of three hours, I assume, right? <laughs> <laughs> Full of ideas. <laughs> right. You know, meetings at 11 o'clock are put that way for a reason. Right. We're all <laughs> <laughs> right. Can I just make one, one comment real quick? Going back to the lighting question, one of our one of our um, our jobs is to look at uh, existing bylaws and regulations, and that includes zoning and subdivision, and to make recommendations about um, uh, about changes that um, influence community character. And it in, our job is to re really try to include historic preservation into those other ordinances, at least historic preservation interests. But a topic like lighting is one that can be raised. Um, in our document to be that even though it's not specifically historic preservation, it's community uh, character related. Um, and so we can look at those types of issues and make recommendations for other bylaws and regulations. Well, I, I Peter, to that point, to that point, Peter, as an electrician that does a lot of uplighting of churches, of houses, of buildings and whatnot, I think it's very important that that something gets put in in concrete and something gets written down um, as a guideline for future Be because with, without that without that you have all kinds of um you know lighting pollution it it, it's, it really is incredible and you see it uh, in some of the more urbanized towns uh, maybe burlington maybe woolburn of all the buildings uh, when you drive by at night and you can see all the LED, even the even the Zakem Bridge, right? That's, you oh. know, how, how it's lit. 
Um, I how quickly we're forgetting, how quickly we're forgetting that Concord voted to take out all the street lights. Yeah. Spent a fortune taking them all out and what, three years later, put them all back in again. So it's a complex um, issue. Right. Um, Thank you. Wow. Just very quickly, I, I think it is um, adverse effect on a historic town and landscape because it's it's an urbanization issue mm -hmm. and it's it really it really diminishes the character of a place i think mm -hmm. that's all absolutely that that's why i said we could keep going on and on and on but uh, <laughs> in the best interest of time um as we uh do i hear a motion to uh adjourn the meeting for today or is there a... I, I do because i have a restless yeah. four-legged creature here I have okay. to go. Second. <laughs> uh, so I moved. I, 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 uh, the meeting is officially adjourned.